Hey everyone, this video is not exactly a tutorial, hence the title. I've written this demo for a star pathfinding and I've also rewritten an existing demo, changed the code to make it a lot simpler to understand. In this video, I'm going to run you through the code, the changes, and you can find the sources in the video description. Let's start with the navigation polygon 2D. This is a tool to have your character navigate on a map. In the demo, you can click anywhere on this complex map and the character will find a path to it. The Nav2D node always finds the shortest path. The character is really going to cut corners as much as possible. In this implementation, it strictly follows the path that's generated by the node. So looking at the code, you can click on the script on the nav2d node to access it. At the start of the game, nothing happens, but when you click on the map, it calls the update navigation path method that's right below it. This takes the start and end position you want to give to the path. And in the navigation2d node, you have a get simple path method that will return an array of points stored as a pool vector to array and not as a regular array. This is important because the pool vector to array doesn't have exactly the same method as an array. So you cannot pop values from the front or the back of the array. You can only push a value to the back. This is a class that exists for performance reasons, but instead of popping front, you'll have to use the remove method with the index zero. When you call this get simple path method, I remove the first value from the path because it is always the start position. And in this demo, the start position corresponds to the character's position, so we don't really need it. You have to remove this value because then in the move along path function that gets called from the process function, this is the one that makes the character actually follow the path. You interpolate between the points in the path vector pull to array. Move along path takes the character current position on the path as a starting point. Then it's going to loop through the available points in the path array. So it starts with the first point, the next point the character has to reach on the path. To find the new character position, we interpolate from its current position in the last point variable in this case to the first point in the path array. And we use a ratio, the distance divided by the distance between the character and the point. The idea is that if the point is too far for the character to go past this frame, we directly get out of the loop and this is the end of the function. We'll just move the character directly. So you can see the function sets the character's position. Instead, we could return it at the end of the function and change the character's position in the process method. But as the method is named move along path, I thought it would be a bit clearer if it would directly move the character along the path. Now there's the next condition. We first have to check what's at the end of the loop before we can understand what happens here. As you loop through the points on the curve, you remove the distance between points, between first the character and the next point on the curve, then the first point in the array and the second point in the array, then the second and the third point, etc. It's entirely based on how long the segments are in this array and how fast the character is walking, how big is its walk distance. What happens is you remove the distance between points, then you remove the point. If you reach the end of the loop, this means that the character is going to move past the next point in the array. In the next iteration in the loop, if the character has to fall between two points, we we'll redo this linear interpolate thing. Otherwise, if the otherwise if we reach the end of the path, that's what this conditional block is about. We're going to place the character on the last point in the path, and as we remove the points from the path array as the character gets past them, the last point in the path will always be the 
only one left in the array. When the character reaches it, we set process to false so that we don't call the move along path anymore and we get out of the loop and out of the function. These break statements could be return statements. In that case, it doesn't change anything. I'll add a few things about how the NAF mesh and navigation 2D system works. You need a navigation 2D node first and foremost, and then a nav mesh. The nav mesh is very similar to the collision polygon 2D in that it's a container for a polygon, a shape that you're going to create with the exact same tool, the green button to add vertices, the blue button to modify the existing polygon add points, but also move the existing vertices as they turn blue. Finally, the red icon to delete the points on the path. This can be a manual process, although this being a collision shape, I'm pretty sure you can generate these collision polygons from the code, and that's how you would make a nav mesh that updates in real time, although there's probably a little more code in there. Next up is the A star example. I'm not going to run you through the entire code for this one because as you can see in the script editor, it's a lot longer. There's a little bit of duplicate code. There's two functions you can use to have the character walk along the grid and another one to add the ability to walk through diagonals as well. So Godot's version of the A star pathfinding algorithm, the tool you can use to have a character move between nodes on whatever. It doesn't have to be a grid. You create points however you'd like. So you can create paths that have nothing to do with a grid. Or you just like in this example, you can create a square grid. As far as the A star system in Godot is concerned, it does not matter. By default, it is also 3D, which means you'll have to work a little bit with Vector3. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Before I run you through the script, note that in the project you will find a commented version of the code, and this is probably a lot easier to understand than a 30-minute tutorial that would show you all the steps and probably have you get a bit lost along the way. So the first part as to how to make this work is for one, in this case, I'm using a tile map node. This is quite important as the tile map has some helpful function to convert from the grid to the world space. And you will see that we use that in the code. Then there are two important variables that we need. First, we need to create an A star node from the code. You cannot create it in the scene like usual. As you'll see, if I search for A star, it does not exist. There are a few utility nodes or classes that you can only create and access from the code in Godot. This is one of them. The reason probably being that it works for both 2D and 3D in that case. While in the node tree, when you try to add node, most of them are either 2D or 3D. And the navigation 2D we just saw, that's the case for it. Same thing for the nav polygon. Next up is the map size and giving your map bounds or a limited amount of nodes to connect is very important to make the A star work. So the A star algorithm is going to take a series of nodes, a series of points that you connect however you'd like. You can connect some only one way, just as if you were making a bridge or have, for example, the ability for the character to move down from a building in 3D, but not move back up through the same way. So it could jump down, but not up. This kind of flexibility is why this A star node is a little more complex than the usual nodes you would find in Godot, but it's very powerful at the same time. And with this demo, you have a template to work with. So then I have two variables that I store, the path start and end position. These depend on where the player clicks when you play the demo. If you click, you're going to set the end point and shift click to set the starting point. And every time you do that, it calls the set path start position and set path 
and position methods that are at the very end of the script. So I'm going to drag it all the way down. These two functions do very similar things. They first check that you did not click on an obstacle. Then they check that you did not click outside of the map. Next, if you are setting the path start position, it's going to remove the old sprite for the start position, so the blue S, and it's going to change it to the new cell. So to do this on the tile map node, you call the set cell method. You input the X and Y position on the tile map on the grid, minus one to erase a tile, or you can pass the integer value the ID of the cell you want to display. Let me go back to the tilesets folder and I'll open the tileset.tres resource. You can see that it has categories 0, 1 and 2. These are the IDs that you pass with the set cell method. So if I open one, this is our blue S that corresponds to the start position. If I go down to the set path and position, we are using the number two, the end yellow block. When you call a setter like that, you have to always pass in a value and then make sure that you assign the value to the variable that you are setting, that you are modifying. Then if the player has already defined an end position and if the end position is not equal to the start position, we recalculate the path. Something similar happens, the set path and position. All right, let me fold these two as we've gone through them and go back to the start of the script. So there are a few more variables. Obstacles for one, these are set in the ready function and it's just checking which cells use this tile, the gray tile. So it has an ID of zero and I'm using the tile maps get used cells by ID to get an array of all the obstacles in the map. There are two more values that you shouldn't change from the code. It's updated in a function. Point path, the list of points that connect the path start position to the path end position. And this is calculated and returned by the A star node. Then half cell size is half the size of the cell in the tile map. 64 by 64 by default, divided by two in this case. At the start of the game, when we first encounter the map, a function is going to gather a list of all the walkable cells and put that in an array. It's handled by the A star add walkable cells function. And this one goes through the map. It uses the map size X and Y. It loops through all the cells in the tile map within that map size grid value. And it checks that the coordinates it finds are not in the obstacles array so that, so that these cells don't have the tile that's gray and that represents an obstacle. Then it calculates an index for each of these points. When you add points in your A star node, you have to give them an index. That's how you're going to access them. And as a second argument, the coordinates of the point. So the index can be any number, but here we have a function that's going to always calculate the index accurately from the point's coordinates. This is very important because then using point coordinates, we can retrieve an index in the A star node and make sure that this does exist. You have to use this add point method to populate the A star node with a list of coordinates that the character or anything can walk from and to. But this is not enough to make the A star node work because then you have to define connections from which point to which point can the character walk. And this is handled by the A star connect walkable cells uh, diagonal or the non-diagonal version. I'm going to show you this one as it's little simpler. So it's going to loop through the points we got from the add walkable cells method. In this example, it is all the cells that are not obstacles. So it loops through the points, it calculates their index value again, and then we calculate a list of four points that are 
the cell to the left, to the top, to the right, and below the current cell in the loop, in the array. And we check that these cells exist in the A star node. So when you check for that, the problem is on the edges of the map, it's going to uh, look for non-existent points. So that's why it first checks if the point is outside the map bounds. And then it's going to check if the A star node has the point, if it exists. The A star node does not have the obstacles. If you try to check for one of these relative points and that's a wall or an obstacle, the A star node won't have it. So you can't connect to it, which is the last step in the loop. The connect points is how you connect points on the graph. Again, you can do this however you want, but if you want to create a grid and four direction movements, you can only connect to the point that's to the right, to the top, to the left, and right below the current cell, which is what this function does. Next up, we have two very simple functions to always calculate the right point index. It takes a point coordinates, a vector two, and it returns the index. This little calculation makes sure that we always have only one index value that can match one point coordinates. So there are two functions for drawing that are really just for the example. You can check them if you want. So they replace the start and end point and they draw lines based on the path that the recalculate path method calculated calls these two clear previous path drawing and update methods that are just drawing functions. Then the important part to calculate the path is this one. We have the starting point and end point indices that we need to retrieve points or to pass to the A star node. So we use the calculate point index method again. And then we ask the A star node to give us a point path so this method is going to return a list of vector three coordinates, uh, vector three polar array, most likely. And it needs the starting point index and the end point index. You cannot pass in point coordinates to the A style node. This is why these indices are so important. And that is essentially how this works. If you download this demo in the future, you may expect it to have some character that walks along the path. But essentially, if you want to do that, have the character walk along the path, be sure to separate the A star pathfinding code from your character. So as this video is out, you should find a link in the video description to download the Godot demo. You will find some commented script in the A star demo that will help you better understand how the code works and why it is designed this way. That's it. Thank you kindly for watching. See you in the next one. Bye bye.